I think we'll, we'll start now. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Justice Simon Thorley. He's a judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court. But more than that, he is, uh, Amanda can't hear me apparently, uh, he is um, a, um, a living expert on intellectual property rights. I think he knows just about everything there is to know about intellectual property rights. And that's what he's going to share with us today. So Justice Thorley. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not quite sure how this microphone is going to work. Can you all hear? Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, he, Anselmo very kindly says I know everything there is to know about IP law. Uh, the truth of the matter is that I used to know quite a bit about IP law. I ceased practice two years ago when I was invited to join the SICC, which is when I met him. Um, since then, I have struggled to keep up with the progress of IP law because, frankly, around the world, it is developing at an enormous pace. When I started my career at the bar in 1972, okay, I'm old, yeah, I accept that. Um, IP was not taught as a subject at any university in UK. I don't think it was taught at any university in the US. It was about that time people started to realize there was a thing called IP. And the developments that have been made in IP over the past 40 years are, are quite phenomenal. Uh, and one thing that has developed at the same time is uh, international trade. And the difficulty is that many IP rights, most IP rights, are based in national law. And therefore, there is a problem for an international trader as to how they're going to protect their IP rights when they are marketing their products from Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, through to all the European countries and uh, the States. Uh, and what I want to look at today, briefly if I can, is why there isn't an accepted international forum for revolve, uh, resolving these disputes, and to talk about the possible fora for doing so, particularly uh, arbitration. Can I start by going back a little uh, to the late 19th century? This is when the international community began to coordinate the basis on which IP rights were granted throughout the commercial world. The period of the Industrial Re Revolution, a great number of new inventions were being made. The motor car, for example. And in 1883, the Paris Convention on uh, Patents was signed. It was followed by the Bern Convention on Copyright three years later in 1886. And the Madrid Convention on Trademarks came in in 1892. But all these were treaties seeking to harmonize the principles of the grant of national rights. There was no attempt to provide for an international tribunal for determining the validity of those rights, nor was there a system for international resolution of IP rights. This, when you look back at it, wasn't particularly surprising. Uh, international trade was in its infancy. It was regulated in the main by the law of contract, and the marketing of goods was done on a national scale. If I wanted to, mark, to publish a book in the UK, I used a UK publisher. If I wanted to market it in the US, I used a US publisher. And they, of course, would be vigilant to protecting my IP rights in each country. A patented product would be sold abroad not by the manufacturer, but by a distributor in the given country. 
an infringement, if it occurred, would usually only be in one country. Dispute resolution was therefore handled by the national courts. Things were very different in relation to contractual disputes because, uh, again, goods were passing across national boundaries and there therefore had to be contracts regulating the distribution, supply, sale of those goods. In 1889, the first English Arbitration Act was passed, which coincided with the adoption of a number of standard form contracts, which lawyers have been happily arguing about ever since. Breach of those clauses led naturally to arbitration, and it led to the formation of the London Court of International Arbitration, the LCIA, uh, in 1889, which is still a thriving dispute resolution centre today. In London, in 1895, you can see I've been doing a bit of history research, uh, the Commercial Court was established as part of the High Court in London. This follows demands from the City of London, where the business was done, for a tribunal or court manned by judges with knowledge and experience of commercial disputes. They could determine such disputes expeditiously and economically, therefore avoiding the long, tedious and expensive trials with verdicts given by judges or even by juries unfamiliar with business practice. Now you might say, what a very good idea. Isn't it sensible to have people who understand a particular aspect of law acting as judges within that law? It was a then modern example of the courts created by the medieval guilds. And uh, in 1898, Pollock and Maitland wrote a history of English law and they said, there can hardly exist a body of men permanently united by any common interest that will not make for itself a court of justice if it be left for a few years to its own devices. And if you look back on history, that is what has happened. And indeed, that is what is happening in the field of IP now. It's just taking rather a long time uh, for anything to come to fruition. So far as arbitration was concerned, resolution of international contract disputes by arbitration or through a national court uh, has now become the norm. We have the Hong Kong International Arbitration Tribunal, we've got the Singapore one, there's London, there's WIPO in Geneva and so on lots of contract resolution dispute centers, but the same has not been the same for resolution of tort disputes, notwithstanding that international trade has now become the norm, uh, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. But no attempt was made to create an international patent or trademark court. Recently, the EU has instituted a pan-European trademark and is seeking to do this a trademark court and is seeking to do the same with patents. But there's no prospect at the moment of a worldwide agreement on litigation of patents or trademarks in a single court. I'm therefore going to focus for a short time on the available options for international dispute resolution of nationally granted uh, IP rights. I'm talking mainly, of course, about patents and trademarks. Uh, but why has an international arbitration court not been developed? There was plainly a need. It was not commercially sensible to have to litigate in Germany, France, the Netherlands, UK, and in places like Hong Kong at the same time. Speaking 
purely personally and totally selfishly, I am, of course, most grateful for this. Such a court did not exist whilst I was at the bar, and cases like the Improver and Remington case in the 1990s was a classic example of international dispute resolution working wonderfully, but only for the lawyers. I acted for Improver both in the UK and in Hong Kong. In the UK, there was an application for an interlocutory injunction. It was the subject of an appeal. The same happened in Germany. But unfortunately, the German court on a patent granted by the same patent office in, the, in Munich came to diametrically oppose conclusions to that of the English court. There was then a trial and an appeal in Hong Kong. Common sense cried out for a central dispute resolution. Why, why has none been created? Why has an arbitration not been in vogue for IP disputes? Why has there been an enormous increase in arbitration and mediation around the world, yet it's not become the norm for IP disputes? I, th I think there are two broad reasons why this has happened, or not happened what one might call internal and external reasons. The internal reasons reside in the nature of litigants, what one might call the eggs in one basket syndrome. Uh, as you know, litigants fall generally into two categories. The first is where one party or the other is using litigation as a commercial weapon where delay, cost, and uncertainty are essential aspects of the tactics. Such litigants will never agree to arbitration because it would defeat the object of the exercise. The second, however, and this is increasingly the case, consists of parties who cannot resolve the differences between themselves and need an independent judicial determination but who wish to do this quickly, cheaply, and as fairly as possible. To those, to, litigants, to those litigants, particularly if the dispute is in many jurisdictions, arbitration would offer a sensible route forward. However, as matters develop, there was no consistency of results in national courts. I've just talked about Improver, where you got one result in England and another result in Germany. Unless the arbitral tribunal had both consistency and the respect of the litigants, <coughs> there was a real danger of losing a potentially valid monopoly at one stroke. And thus, fear of the unknown ruled, even for what I might call sensible litigators. The external reasons arose out of international legislation, such as Article 22.4 of an EC Council resolution which is known as Brussels 1. What it basically says is that the state in which the right is registered has exclusive jurisdiction over the validity of that right. So if you want to re revoke a patent granted in Germany, you've got to go to the German courts. You can't ask an English court to rule on the validity of the English, court, English patent, the German patent, and so on. Uh, it, national rights are what we call rights in rem. They are valid against the entire world. Uh, and you cannot have an arbitral agreement which is binding against third parties. Equally, there was a concern that if you got a decision in personam, in other words, a, a decision simply binding on the parties to the arbitration, that there may be difficulty enforcing that award 
in the jurisdiction of one of the parties if that was not the jurisdiction in which the award was made. And this is due to Article 5 of the New York Convention. As you see, looking at that, if you go to a foreign court to seek to enforce an arbitral award, the foreign court cannot enforce it if the enforcement of the award was contrary to public policy in that country. Now, the New York Convention is a very vital aspect of international arbitration. It's the means by which an award made in one country can be enforced against a party resident in another. This is the lifeblood of international arbitration because without it, it would be too easy for the losing party simply to say, go on, try and enforce your rights. And before parties embark on arbitration, they must be satisfied that whoever wins will, and I emphasize will, be able to enforce it in the state of residence of the losing party. It's no use going to your lawyer who says, let's arbitrate this agreement if he that you're, you, you then say, but I'm not sure in the final event I shall be able to enforce it in whichever country it is that the other party resides in. So this is a provision which one has to have significant regard to because there was and is a feeling in some jurisdictions that for an arbitral tribunal to make any ruling upon the validity of a national right would be contrary to public policy. And I shall come back to that, if I may, a little later. But notwithstanding that, slowly the wind of change has been blowing through the conservative world of IP protection, and international businessmen began to see the wisdom of a quotation from the great Qing dynasty emperor, Kangzi. I'm sure you're all familiar with the works of the emperor Kangzi. He ruled China for 61 years, from 1662 until 1722. He strongly advocated arbitration as opposed to litigation. I only came across this, this quotation last year. Uh, I'm sure you've all had it since uh, your cradles. The good citizens who may have difficulties amongst themselves will settle them like brothers by referring to the arbitration of some old man or the mayor of the commune. As for those who are troublesome, obstinate, and quarrelsome, let them be ruined in the law courts. That is the justice that is due to them. Now, speaking in my capacity as a judge of the SICC, I have to be a little concerned about observations of that sort, but when proposing arbitration, my capacity of, of, of an arbitrator, that one can see the wisdom of it. Can I leave aside for a moment a discussion as to whether the nomination of me to join the IP arbitrators on the HKIC is a reflection of the fact that I'm an old man. Uh, equally, don't ask me to think whether I'm suggesting that all IP litigants are troublesome, obstinate, or quarrelsome, although undoubtedly uh, some are not least some of our US colleagues, but don't quote me on that. Oh, you're recording this, aren't you? <laughs> Too late, I've said it. Um, many companies have been ruined by litigation. But the fact that panels such as the Hong Kong panel and similar panels in London at WIPO and, and in Singapore have now been created does display the perceived need for inter international arbitration dispute resolution. 
what I would like to do now is to compare and contrast the benefits and burdens of resolving international IP disputes through the courts by way of arbitration. And as I say, I'm going to focus on patents and trademarks. What in effect we're looking at is the resolution of tort disputes by way of arbitration. Let's consider that there's a patentee based in the Cayman Islands, manufacturing through a subsidiary in India with a worldwide market in goods covered by a patent. It considers that its patent is being infringed by the manufacture by a US company in Indonesia of a rival product which is being marketed worldwide. The US company is also an innovator who acknowledges that the uncertainty created by a prolonged dispute may adversely affect its reputation and will undoubtedly place a fetter on its future development program. Does it spend money on improving the alleged infringing product or does it abandon this product and develop a new product altogether? They could, of course, litigate in various national courts. But that will be expensive with an outcome that is uncertain. More worryingly, if they chose certain jurisdictions, it would be open to the losing party to start litigation in other jurisdictions uh, in the hope that they could get a different judgment in the other jurisdiction. These facts cry out for the parties to agree upon a single dispute resolution process. This could be done by arbitration and indeed has been done by arbitration. There has to be an arbitration agreement so that the tort dispute can be encapsulated in a contract binding on the parties which is susceptible to resolution by arbitration as any other contract can be. So can I look first at the advantages of arbitration? There are obvious high-level advantages. It enables the parties to resolve what could be a multiplicity of national disputes involving the same basic patent at one hearing. The cost, time and that cost and time benefits are clear. There's only one set of lawyers, witnesses giving evidence only once. I've frequently had cases where I have as my expert witness a professor from America who gives Ameri evidence in the American proceedings. He then comes over to London to give evidence in the London proceedings. We are given all the transcripts of his deposition in America so that we can cross-examine him with the benefit of what he's said before. I can tell you, you do need a great deal of diligence to read through four or five days of US depositions. The amount of useful information that comes out is very slight, but it's always useful and you've got to find it. Uh, the benefit of only cross-examining somebody once uh, is enormous benefit both to you and to him or her. The hearings will be shorter, obviously, if you have arbitrators who are skilled in the technology and the law involved. In a little more detail, I can consider these advantages under four headings. Control, confidentiality, appeals and enforcement. Control can be divided up into those four headings, choice of procedure, appointment of arbitrators, agreed time limits, and relief. Choice of procedure, the parties can select the arbitral system they wish to use. They may choose to arbitrate under the auspices of one of the well-known international bodies. I've mentioned the LCIA, there's the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, and of course, there, there is the, high, uh, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. They have fixed rules of procedure, and, but the parties will therefore know at the outset what the procedure is that they're letting themselves in for. But the parties can choose 
The practice and procedure is not thrust on them. They can choose, if they wish, to arbitrate on what's known as an ad hoc basis, setting out their own rules. I can give you an example of a case that I was involved in. The parties agreed that the arbitration would last for a fixed period with the time to be equally divided between the two parties. The parties were to agree the procedure between themselves. The lawyers were to agree the procedure between themselves or by default by the arbitrators. And it was a term of the arbitrator's appointment that they would not be paid if they didn't produce their award within 28 days of the end of the arbitration. It can be done if everybody wants to, and in that case, it worked. But where uh, the dispute involves IP rights in various countries, there are a number of matters that have to be considered in advance. What is to be the proper law of the arbitration? in the sense of which law is to apply as to the admissibility of evidence, for example, or to decide questions of joint liability. But you also have to decide whether the tribunal is to decide infringement and validity of each of the national rights in question under the law of each country, so that the validity of the French patent will be decided under French law, the validity of the Hong Kong patent under Hong Kong law and so on, or whether you are going to decide that it should be decide, it, the decision under one national law should be decisive for all rights. Obviously the latter is very much cheaper and quicker, but you can see there may be the eggs in one basket syndrome that comes into effect. Secondly, the choice of arbitrators is a very significant freedom. You are not presented with a fait accompli provided by the national court system, which allocates a judge, possibly at random, when the dispute is well on the way to trial. In UK, for example, you will rarely find out the identity of your trial judge until a few weeks before trial. You may well end up with a judge that does not understand or is not familiar with the relevant technology, whilst no doubt a very intelligent person, it takes time to educate a judge in the technology, which of course is done at your expense. So when you are in arbitration, it is usual for one party to select one arbitrator and the other party to select the other, with the two then selecting the man in the middle or the woman in the middle, who on the whole has to do most of the work. But you can choose people who have a background either in the law or the technology, and if you wish, both. You can have, therefore, both neutrality and expertise by your own choice. You can, of course, have a single arbitrator if the parties can agree this, and that is usually the quickest and cheapest way to do it, because obviously you have to fix a date for the hearing of the arbitration, which is convenient to the arbitrators, to the lawyers involved, to the witnesses involved, and so on. And the fewer people whose diaries you have to uh, bring together the better. Time limits. In commerce, delay equals uncertainty. People want to know what they can do. And by, the way, by way of arbitration, you can agree the time limits between you, as is in the example I gave you. You can agree the amount of disclosure that is going to take place which again is a time-consuming ex expense. You can agree on the length of the hearing, although I have to say that agreement often disappears out of the window as the hearing begins to progress and needs to be fairly robustly handled by the chairman of the arbitrators uh, if it is not to degenerate into a significant delay. Uh, fourth, relief. 
it's open to the parties to prescribe the relief that is to be granted, unlike in a court case where the relief is set out in the national legislation and is subject to the approval of the court. And I want to talk a little bit about relief because this can be a difficult area. Let's take the pattern case I was talking about. Let's assume that the parties agree that internationally the validity and infringement of the patent is to be decided under the HKIAC, under Hong Kong law. But what is then going to happen if the patent is held valid and infringed? What is the defendant going to do? The arbitration agreement must define this. There is going to be worldwide relief is the relief going to be that the defendant will withdraw his product from the market worldwide? Or is there going to be an agreement that if held valid and infringed, there will be a license granted by the patentee to the infringer at a predetermined rate? The one thing you don't want to have when there's a finding of validity of infringement is a further hearing to determine what the royalty rate should be. If the health patent is held valid but not infringed, relief will probably lie in a declaration of non-infringement, immunity from suit, in effect, in all the other jurisdictions. It becomes more difficult if the patent is held to be invalid but infringed. In other words, the monopoly is not a valid monopoly, but if it were to be, there would be infringement. The most straightforward order is that the patentee will apply to all the national patent offices to surrender the patent. That's pretty straightforward and cannot be objectionable. But declarations of immunity from suit Royalty, royalty licenses at a low royalty rate and so on can be agreed, but the great problem then is competition law. Now, I am not a competition lawyer. I know where there are competition lawyers, and the moment I see a suggestion of this sort coming up, I say go and talk to your competition lawyers and make sure that you're not uh, exposing yourself to any problems. Uh, finally, of course, provision can be made for the payment of costs. A small caveat here, arbitration involves the costs of providing facilities for the arbitration, the premises, the secretarial support, the costs of the arbitrators themselves. And living in a deeply cynical world as we do, it has to be appreciated that when arbitrators are working on a case, they're being paid by the hour. And in some cases, there is no incentive for a speedy decision-making process. This all has to be taken into account before deciding to arbitrate. The second of the aspects I was going to talk about is confidentiality. And this is a very, very important aspect of arbitration, both good and bad. Confidential people on the whole do not wish to have their business dealings, particularly their alleged failures, published to the world. They don't want their customers or potential customers to know there's a question mark over the validity of the patent, particularly where the pa parties have customers in common. Arbitrations are held in private and the award is not published. This has a particular benefit when confidential information is involved. That information can be dis disclosed in private to the other party and should never be made public. I say should because there is not total control. Uh, in limited cases where an appeal arises to a national court, those courts will hear the appeal in general in public and will insist on open proceedings and will oft 
normally will give a judgment which does not incorporate the confidential information. But uh, in a recent case, the Swiss Court of Appeal insisted on publishing everything in the interests of open justice. So one has to beware that you cannot guarantee that your secrets will be maintained, but certainly there is a better chance than uh, in uh, normal court proceedings. Next, one comes to appeals. I can't remember if I've got anything now. I've just got appeals. Arbitration has the great advantage that it gives, allows for finality at an early date. The ability for a losing party to have an arbitral agreement, an arbitral award reviewed by way of an appeal to a national court is severely limited. The downside, of course, is that the losing party doesn't have the opportunity of a second bite at the cherry. This is a very attractive provision in many cases to the parties to get certainty at an early date. Finally, we turn to enforcement. Once an award is given and relief granted, it's necessary to have the means of enforcing the order through the courts if the losing party turns out to be less than willing to comply. Uh, as I indicated, processes have been developed over the, uh, the years and the current New York Convention is pretty straightforward. There are, however, the concerns I referred to earlier arising out of Article 5.2. Uh, because IP rights are national rights, it might be thought to be contrary to public policy to enforce an award made abroad saying that your national patent office has wrongly granted the patent. Uh, this seemed to me and to many others to be little, that there seemed to me to, to, and to many others that there was little justification for this concern. But it's no comfort to arbitral parties to be told that Simon Thorley QC doesn't have many concerns. A number of jurisdictions in consequence, starting with the US in 1893, passed legislation to provide that RB, IP arbitral awards could be enforced. And you may be aware that there is a current amendment to the arbitration ordinance here clarifying that disputes over IP rights may be settled by arbitration and that to do so is not contrary to public policy. As I understand it, this bill is to be passed in May and is to come into effect seven months and one day after it is passed. So by the end of the year, there should be total clarity within Hong Kong. It's going to be done by an amendment to Article, uh, to Section 103C of the Arbitration Bill. A dispute over an IPR includes a dispute over the enforceability, infringement, subsistence, validity, ownership, scope, duration, or any other aspect of an IPR. So totally wide-ranging. It also covers a dispute over a transaction or any compensation. So I think that is fairly wide-ranging. I can't see anything that isn't going to be covered. So that, in relation to an IP dispute now defined, an IPR dispute may be arbitrated. That's pretty straightforward too. And an IPR dispute is capable of settlement by arbitration as between parties to the IPR. So if there was any doubt, that has been resolved. The legislation has said that IPR can be resolved, obviously on an, uh, on an uh, in personam basis, as between the parties, the result cannot be that the National Patent Office here is obliged to revoke the patent if the arbitrators hold that it is invalid. It has got to be within the arbitration agreement to make the patent holder 
apply to the Patent Office to remove the patent. But there is a wind of change moving in that direction too. The Swiss have now provided that if you publish the arbitration award, and the award is that the patent should be revoked, the Swiss patent should be revoked, then the Patent Office can act on that award. So we're moving slowly in the direction of arbitration being a substitute for the court process. In contrast to a judgment of a national court, the potentially great advantages of an arbitral award is that the relief granted uh, can be international. It's not confined to an adjudication on a single IPR right. So far, we've been looking at the benefits of arbitration. What are the advantages of court proceedings? Choice of court. Arbitrations have to be consensual. One party cannot strike first. There has got to be an arbitration agreement before you can start. Where, however, a patentee identifies a potential infringer, it can unilaterally choose the court where it considers it has the best chance of obtaining a finding of infringement and validity. The courts of some countries have an established track record on IP disputes. The judges are technically competent and experienced in the law. There's thus a measure of predictability. Some procedures are more beneficial than others. The German system tries infringement separately from validity, and this is thought to increase the chances of obtaining a final injunction at an early date, and often does. The UK system provides for a measure of disclosure and cross-examination, which you may not get in a civil law jurisdiction. But the same applies to the infringer. It can unilaterally start proceedings for a declaration of non-infringement in many jurisdictions. And if only infringement and not validity is an issue, it can invite one national court to rule upon the question of infringement under several patents. This happened in the recent ongoing litigation in the UK between activists and Eli Lilly, a pharmaceutical case, Activists considered it had the best chance of a finding of non-infringement in the UK courts. So sought a declaration, not only that it didn't infringe the UK patent, but also that it didn't infringe the equivalent French, Spanish, Italian and German. The UK courts had jurisdiction because validity was not an issue, therefore there was no uh, Article 22 of the European regulation to pre prevent the UK court giving judgment. The UK court held that there was no infringement, fundamentally on a pan-European basis. The Court of Appeal agreed, and last week the case was heard in the Supreme Court. So it hasn't been quite as quick as the uh, defendants or the infringers might have hoped, but they have put a package together in one country as a small aside to that, the German court took little notice of the fact that the UK court was technically first seized and that therefore the German court should decline itself to have jurisdiction. As you can probably understand the Germans were not enamoured with the idea of having infringement of one of their patents decided by some ignorant judge in London. Sorry, take the word ignorant out. Some judge in London. Uh, and they determined that they would hear the case themselves. That litigation went last, the end of last year to the Bundesgerichtshof, the German Supreme Court, who disagreed with the finding of infringement that had been made in the appeal court in Germany and the appeal court in UK, and remitted matter to the lower court for further consideration. So, what looked as if it was going to be a means for getting more or less a pan-European decision has proved not to be the case. Public hearings. Confidentiality is not all it's cracked up to be. It is a good thing. 
But the problem is that everything that goes on in the arbitral process is confidential. Whilst this protects trade secrets, it also permits the machinations of one party who concludes that delay might be in its best interests, who appoint or who appoints what are known as tame arbitrators that they can believe can be re relied upon to sanction time limits suitable to their needs. Where there is little prospect of an appeal, conduct on the outrageous, verging on the outrageous, can, and I emphasize can, occur. On the whole, the oxygen of publicity discourages maverick behavior by either party and indeed serves, serves to focus the minds of the litigators and the judges on the task at hand. Next, court judgments are public judgments. And a public judgment that an IP right is valid is an enormous PR weapon in the hands of the right holder. Uh, likewise, a public statement that the rival's product does not infringe a patent or trademark gives public certainty to distributors and to consumers. Provisional measures. As you know, most courts have well-established provisions which allow aggrieved parties in appropriate cases to seek interim injunctions. In certain circumstances, the procedure of arbitral systems do provide for the award of emergency measures. These systems are less well-tried and tested. The usual route, therefore, where interim relief is required in arbitral proceedings is to seek them from the relevant national court, which slightly defeats the process, the procedure uh, and the objects of the exercise. The next is, a, is a, an often unheralded benefit of court proceedings, which is control over third parties. Arbitrations necessarily are based on contractual agreements, even if they are ad hoc after the event agreements. Third parties will not be bound by such agreements because they're not parties to them. They cannot be joined to the proceedings against their will, uh, nor can they be ordered to provide disclosure. In most court proceedings, third parties can be joined against their will where it is necessary for uh, the doing of justice uh, to uh, achieve this. They can have provisional orders made against them. They can be ordered to provide disclosure. They can be bound by the judgment. And most important, they can be made to pay the costs. Appeals, the contrast with arbitration is obvious. Uh, national systems do provide a structured appellate system, sometimes as of right, sometimes requiring permission before you can do it, which does introduce a measure of fairness, since even the best judicial system does throw up the occasional uh, less than perfect uh, judgment the presence of an appellate structure does tend to focus the judicial mind. The consequence, of course, is delay and cost. Enforcement and costs. A national court is precisely that. It's a court with national, not international jurisdiction. An injunction can stop a party trading within that country, but does not have international effect. But where the losing party has a presence and assets in the jurisdiction, an injunction will have a material effect on its trade. An award by a court can rapidly be enforced under the law of contempt. Doesn't take long when you tell the chief executive officer of your client who has lost that if he doesn't comply with the injunction, he will end up in prison for him to make a decision that he will comply with the order. But that is not the same, of course, if the assets of the defendant are abroad. 
they can just stop trading in UK, but they have no means of enforcing an award of costs or damages. Now, there are a number of international agreements, some bilateral, some more wide-ranging, the most recent being the Hague Convention on the Recognition uh, and Enforcement of Foreign Judgments. I gather that on the 7th of October last year, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government released a consultation paper on whether it should ratify. It has been ratified in all the EU countries, uh, and in Singapore, and I believe in Mexico. Uh, there is talk even of it being ratified in the US, but that was under the previous administration. It's been signed by the US, but not, not yet ratified. So, progress is being made on a convention which is very similar to the New York Convention for uh, Arbitration. If this, come, uh, if this comes into force, then it will be a significant added impetus to going to court uh, rather than going to uh, arbitration. But judges are not freely available. Time can be wasted in trying to fix a trial date convenient to the parties and experts that also pits in with the court timetable. Equally, though, the, so, the best arbitrators are also in demand, so I suspect overall this is probably a neutral point. What it comes down to is that arbitration is not a utopian option. No current system is perfect in the case where there are national IP rights and international trade. Litigation must of necessity be an expensive option delay and uncertainty is inevitable. On the whole, commercial people seek to avoid litigation and when it arises, regard it as an unfortunate necessity which they seek to resolve by the best means available. But best, of course, involves winning and not everybody can win. It will be brave parties who agree to arbitration of valuable IP rights on an international basis, but no braver than subjecting those rights to adjudication by a multitude of national courts steeped in delay and uncertainty. The option is therefore one that should be considered and indeed now is being considered uh, seriously by those involved in international trade uh, in goods covered by IP rights and those involved in advising them. I suspect that many of them, like me, have recently come across the thoughts of Emperor Kangxi, which I referred you to earlier. Thank you very much. Justice Thorne kindly agreed to uh, answer questions um, are there any questions that anyone would like to raise? It's always at this moment that there is complete silence in the room. Uh, yes, Joshua. Why don't you press the button in, uh, in front of you and then speak to the microphone? Uh, thank you, Mr. Justice Forley, for the talk. Uh, actually, I'd like to ask about how do you think uh, IP rights arbitration would develop in China, especially given some recent cases, for example, New Balance or uh, well, uh, Under Armour, that sort of cases, court cases in, 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 in China, their judgments. I think, I think I'm going to duck that and pass that over to the professor, who I know is far more up to date on these things than I am. I, I think the professor will, will duck that question as well. Um, <laughs> We are fortunate to have a representative from the Department of Justice, from the DOJ here today, and perhaps um, she might say something about at least, well, not, not China as a whole, but how Hong Kong uh, envisages um, its um, liberalization of 
IP arbitration along the lines discussed by uh, Justice Thorley, how Hong Kong envisages that will be taken up and does Hong Kong envisage that that will be popular, especially with mainland parties? Um, it's Grace Yip from the DOJ. I will try to answer professor's questions and instill your statements. Thank you very much. But, um, Press, make sure that the light is on. Yeah. But um, maybe my answer is not uh, comprehensive because um, it may not be uh, wholly represented the views of my department. But just um, according to my understanding, because there are growing demand um, uh, of the IP trading area in, uh, according to the WIPO uh, statistics. And also maybe uh, in the Bell and Road uh, initiative, you will see a uh, more increasing lead of uh, education of IP rights. So uh, we want to promote Hong Kong as a seat of arbitrations uh, as well as an IP mediation and arbitration center. So our focus is not just on IP arbitrations. We also focus on evaluative mediations to resolve IP disputes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not in a position to give a specific comments on, on the case you have, you have cited because um, I think I need to have uh, some de detailed looks uh, with, with what the uh, articles you have read. I think you have read uh, a commentary in the Hong Kong lawyer about the Liu Barnes case. Yes. Um, uh, if you want me to address more, maybe uh, you can send me an email. I will try to. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, so, Joshua, you can um, get uh, Grace's email uh, at the end of today's uh, uh, lecture. She'll be very, very happy. She's, she's dealing with all matters relating to arbitration. Um, she's dealing with that on behalf of the uh, DOJ. Could I also say that she used to be um, an officer of the Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators? Well, I think just to build on that, I think what you're identifying is one of the crucial aspects of arbitration in that the parties must have confidence in the system. And that means you've got to have competence, confidence in the arbitrators and in the jurisdiction where the uh, arbitration is being carried out. And without that, business people will not use arbitration, but equally they will seek to avoid courts where they don't have confidence in the judicial system. And it, it goes sort of round in a circular fashion that we want arbitration, but we've got to have confidence. If we don't have confidence, we'll have to look to the courts. Uh, and I think this is very much what you're talking about, that, that if one can get the HKIAC IP panel as a recognized forum for dealing with uh, IP disputes it gets credibility it will then get more business it's the starting this is the problem that people are reluctant to commit themselves to the unknown other questions perhaps we might broaden the uh, subject a little bit and um, we've got a very young audience here. You, you referred to yourself, I wasn't sure, as an old man. Uh, you referred to Kang Shi. Yeah, a lot of um, students here are, are interested in starting careers in IP law. And on the basis of your experience, what do you suggest would be the best way to get started if I'd like to start developing a career in IP law? I, I've heard you on IP arbitration. I'd like to become involved in this more. Um, am I just a small potato if I'm just a, a student graduating from Hong Kong University and uh, it's really all for old men and there's no real role for younger people? What would you suggest? I would suggest that's nonsense. Um, I was saying earlier that um, IP as a, an area of law has expanded enormously and is still expanding. The developments in both pharmaceuticals and telecoms and computers, I don't suppose you remember living in an age before the email. 
we used to try and deal with faxes or before that with telex machines. International communication has developed significantly and what the world needs in IP lawyers is people who understand the law but who also understand commerce and technology. And frankly, young people are rather better at that than dear old things like me. Um, I have been on this lecture tour and I gave a lecture, I gave two lectures actually in Singapore before I came here. And to thank me for giving the lectures, they very kindly gave me an eye watch. That fills me full of fear and trepidation. I have happily got two of my now significantly grown up children coming to stay with me for Easter. They will try to tell me how to use it and I know one of them will try to t confuse me no end with it so that hopefully I give it to him. Now young people can assimilate technology far faster than old people. Young people can communicate with their peer group in business far better than I can. And the fact of the matter is that a large number of the technology companies are driven by younger people. The big law firms and the firms chamber sets of chambers have come to realize this and younger people are being given much greater responsibility both in handling clients and in uh, assisting in litigation than they ever were in my day uh, and this can only be a good thing so my uh, advice to you is don't be ashamed of saying what you're good at if you understand how an eye watch works, there's no harm in saying so. Uh, can I tell you a very short story? Have we got time for a short story? We've got all the time in the world. In 1979, I was rung up. I was then 29. I was born in 1950. May seem a long time ago as far as you're concerned. Uh, I was rung up. I was 29. I was rung up by a junior partner in the firm that was then called Clifford Turner, it's now called Clifford Chance. And he said to me, what do you know about copyright in computer programs? I said, absolutely nothing. He said, well, by Sunday night, could you know something about it and come with me on a plane to San Francisco? They had just started direct flights to San Francisco from London. It was you know, that far ago. We flew into San Francisco. On Monday morning, we ended up in a brand new office in a place called Cupertino. They had just moved into their new office. And they didn't have any boardrooms. They simply had chairs in reception where this young barrister and relatively young solicitor, I think he was 35 at most, were talking to two young men called Jobs and Wozniak. This was Apple. They had just started. Now, they found it much easier to talk to us. They didn't realize that I was technically incompetent, which is probably quite sensible. But they found it much easier to talk to us about what they were doing and how they were doing it and how they were being ripped off by IBM. We spoke to these young men, we got information from them, and it was a copyright case. IBM had borrowed some of their earlier programs. And I said to one of the young programmers, uh, how can you prove that they've copied your program? He said, it was actually very easy. He said, play the program through and I have encrypted at the end of it, written by me on such and such a date. And IBM had managed to copy that as well so naive were the older people in the industry as to compared to what these young people were doing. I did actually take a witness statement of a young man who 
had written one of the programs. He was proud owner of 2% of Apple. And it was wholly unnecessary, but I asked him for his date of birth. He was just 18. Yeah, that's just a, 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 an interesting story, but it shows that communication between young people in a technology-driven industry is a very important thing. And that is what you can do as young people. And none of us, however ancient we have become, loses sight of the fact that you people are probably a great deal better educated than we ever were. You certainly understand technology better than we do, and there's no reason why you shouldn't understand commerce better than we do. A long answer to a fairly short question, I apologize. But an inspiring story. Um, are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? I have one more question in, in, in that, that case. You referred to Hague 2005 Choice of Court Agreements Convention. Um, that has about 30 uh, parties signed up to it. As you said, the European Union, with the exception of Denmark, um, Singapore, Mexico, uh, and um, they've all become parties and they've all acceded. The U.S. has signed it, the Ukraine has signed it, but neither the U.S. nor the Ukraine have uh, ratified or acceded to the convention. The Hague Conference is currently working on a new convention. Um, the, the special commission will be meeting again in, in November for a new convention on the recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters, and that includes IP matters. Um, Marta Pertigas, who's been, influential, who's been um, instrumental in getting the uh, a, a convention going, said that she initially thought that um, those working in the Special Commission would keep out uh, intellectual property from the convention because it would be too tough to deal with. To her surprise, pleasant surprise, she found that people wanted to include provisions on intellectual property in this new convention. How far do you suggest they should go with this new convention, which may come out in draft form uh, for consideration by the Hague Conference generally, probably by the uh, beginning of next year. How far should they go? Should they include uh, judgments relating to the validity of uh, national registries on intellectual property rights? Or should they simply remain at the level of um, intellectual property right questions uh, dealing with infringement, dealing with questions between two parties, in personam rights solely. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned, of course, there is an exception in the Hague Convention, but time didn't allow at the moment, which accepts uh, IP validity matters from enforcement, and this is, this is what the professor's talking about. Um, Dealing with international conventions is always a matter, as the word suggests, of diplomacy. You can't railroad people into making uh, decisions that go a, a long way. You've got to have consensus. I would have thought to deal with it on an in personam basis at the moment is the right way to go because that must be the best way of getting a decision. The competition laws of different countries vary enormously. And inevitably, when you get to questions of enforcing IP rights, you are raising competition law issues because IP rights are the anathema to competition lawyers. Free trade uh, is not compatible with monopolies and the way in which people draw the line between a permissible mo monopoly and an impermissible monopoly uh, is different in different jurisdictions. And I think to get the international community to accept that the decision of a Hong Kong arbitrator can result in the US PTO compulsorily having to revoke a patent may be thought to be a step too far uh, particularly in the modern political world post-Trump. So I would have thought you're better off simply going for in personam at this stage. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, then uh, perhaps I, I just like on everyone's behalf to thank um, Justice Thorley for um, this inspiring um, lecture. Uh, it's ranged wild, widely. 
It started off with Pollock and Maitland. It moved on to Kangxi. Uh, it got in a reference to Steve Jobs, to Mr. Wozniak, and even got in Cupertino there, which uh, I keep finding on my weather report in my smartphone. And I've always wondered why Cupertino? Why of all places Cupertino? I wasn't even sure where Cupertino was until today, uh, when apparently it, it's, it's a destination somewhere in California. But I'd like to thank uh, Professor, uh, Justice Thorley for his, his talk, and perhaps we just give uh, one final round of applause. Thank you very much.